Hello, welcome to the Temple Mount Podcast. I'm Shogun. It is Sunday, and we are doing a Bible study. I will open that Bible study with a short prayer, if nobody minds. Heavenly Father God, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray with faith first to confess to you in our hearts and repent of our sins, and we pray that you will guide us and give us a true spirit of repentance and bring forth fruit works, fruit meat for repentance in us. Wash us in the blood of the Lamb that we may be made clean and rectified to God. And furthermore, as we gather together to study your word, please send the Holy Spirit to grant us discernment. Let only truth be heard and only truth received. And a blessing, we pray, on this community and all the people in the chat. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Secondarily, we might as well say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, Lord, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. So, and, do we want to... Do we want to reread the verse that we were just talking about with Brunick and talk about it? Or should um, we just go somewhere else? I'll jump. I'll jump. Uh, I can just tell you to go do something real quick. I'll jump to the verse in Revelation I had pulled up, and uh, then we can circle back around to it if he comes back. If slash one, he comes back. All right. Yeah, I need like maybe three minutes or something. No worries. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia. Is that one of Philadelphia? Sure. I know your works. Behold. Oh, sorry. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews but are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write him on the name of my God. In the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heavens in my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Yeah, that's epic. You want to give us some exegesis, sis? <laughs> well, without... Doing like the historical commentary. Who's who's the Church of Philadelphia? Where is it? One thing I can I can guarantee you, it's not Pennsylvania. He's not talking to the Church in Pennsylvania. It's in the Philadelphos, Philadelphos. What does Delphos mean again? We know Philo means love. Isn't Delphos like brotherly? Yeah, brothers. Yeah. In the Bible, we have the city of brotherly love. And Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. You also have like the pseudo Adelphoi in the bro- in the Bible, the false brethren. But um Yeah, there's a lot in here. So like one of the major things that this shows is contrary to a lot of people's contrary to a lot of people's eschatology. I actually didn't even mean to read this one, but I meant to read the next one about being lukewarm because it might be more applicable to our our life. But this one's good too because there's a lot of encouragement about you know you're strong, you're you're kind of lowly, but you've been made powerful in the Lord, and you will succeed by God's by God's 
<laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> you will succeed because of your following of the word <clears throat> and patient endurance. But one major thing in here that stands in such stark contrast to other people's eschatology is the Jews are brought to worship at the feet of the Christians because God is showing his love through them, the Christians, to the fake Jews. And uh, <laughs> most people's eschatology has it the other way around. There's a third temple being built. The Gentiles are barely spared by the skin of their teeth, even though they've been the Christians the whole time. And then the Jews are somehow like mass converted and like run the world and we're supposed to go worship at their feet. It's like really crazy that people think that somehow, but I mean, it's just straightforward <coughs> the other way around in, in Revelation. It's because of the ego of the fake Jews. You're missing that point. The ones that wanted to conquer the world, the ones like Soros, like the Nazis, one pulling the strings behind both Nazis and commies. Well, that may or may not be the case, but I think we're trying to keep it to the text at least mostly, right? Well, I was just relating to current topics of the same individuals we're talking about. But in this tribulation that John's claim, the author John claims that he's a partner with them in at the beginning of the book, they have kept his word and not denied his name. So, by doing that, they um, they receive quite quite a powerful reward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the into well, we can read that part again uh, about the um, those who conquer their name will be written on what the one who conquers. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. That's pretty cool. Now, I wonder if the conquering there is like conquering of um, like your own behaviors, conquering of, you know others in the world who are opposed to Christ or like what well, you know what I mean like is there more is there more than that kind of given to kind of give us an idea of what the conquering is over and of yeah I mean <clears throat> well to me this is real easy this is Rome this is Rome contra Judea Rome contra Christianity and that's a what it goes further than that. Rome is yeah. just one example of many. Yeah, they move from one spot to another, that. hiding what they are. The point you're missing is the enemy's still I'm not there. I'm sure I was missing then. I think you just jumped in and interrupted me. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to do a Bible study right now. It won't take too long, but let's keep the like anything extraneous to the Bible and the exegesis like um, to add the conversation that we can have after. It's okay. But Wandering Library is definitely correct that this is uh, a recurring thing. Um, so, for example, the Bible talks about having God's word on your forehead and hand, which the Revelation inverts that for the people to show that people are falling away. And it says they'll have the, the mark of the beast from Rome on their head and their hand. So it's fidelity to the empire, to the government, to the anti-christian side of history fidelity to them rather than the church so conquering is withstanding those spiritual forces in high places that are not flesh and blood it's like withstanding that even up until death and martyrdom as we see both here and throughout history including acts that these people are being killed they're being killed all the day long as paul quotes in Romans 10 from Isaiah 65. They're being killed all all the day long for his sake. And yeah, so they're being rewarded for overcoming that 
spiritual power with uh, good rather than responding to it with evil and thereby reversing the course of history as it had been practiced. But in a more general sense, right? As you become a Christian, first you have to like repent of your own sins and have your own little struggle with your own inner demons. But then also what the world will persecute you. Once you follow Jesus, the whole world will persecute you. And if you endure on to the end, you will be saved. Now, I don't know if that's directly relevant to the verse that Chad read or not, but like I does how I tied it back to what Brunick was saying. Yeah, that, like, that, is, that is kind of circle into it. I think, you know, they're not so divorced either, right? The concepts between that and then the elaboration of that and the second Peter verse that I was talking about. Probably, probably very close to uh, the same thing in most cases. But it doesn't mean that that's the only case, right? Like there could be another type of conquering as well. And this could be, like you guys said, like um, a, a typological thing that happens more than once in various ways, right? Is there anything yep. else you wanted to say about the, the verse in Revelation? No. <laughs> All right. Well, the heading... I like to read the psalm as prayer, you know, like read the psalms as prayer. So if it's all right with you guys, I'd like to read Psalm 39, the heading of which says, A Repentant Heart. Uh, psalm 39, verse 1. I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me while I was musing, the fire burned, then spake I with my tongue. Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as an hand breadth, and mine age as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Salah. Surely every man walketh in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. I was dumb. I opened not my mouth because thou didst it. Remove thy stroke away from me. I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. When thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity, Salah. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee, and a sojourner as all my fathers were. O oh, spare me that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. That's a good one. You know, that's an interesting thing too, like thinking about that, like that prayer, like like in in a uh you know, a um, shorthand version of that, but uh, to to ask God to allow you to know, like, the number of your days and, like, the span of your life or whatever to, to reveal how frail that you are. Um, if if that were granted, you know, to, to know, like, maybe the length of your life, if it were literal, or um, how much time you've got left or whatever, um, that could really change the way you live, um, either for God or, you know, serving your flesh drastically either way. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Um, My church always sings, we are but a moment sunlight fading in the grass. I'm not sure if that's from like a song or what, but it's just to remind us our days are like the passing of like sun that is then obscured by cloud and just like fades away. You know, it's, almo it's almost though like whether or not God does or does not reveal that to you. If you woke up every day and you made that your focus, like, my life is so short. I don't know how much I've got left. And you, you planned your day from that morning as though it was your last one. How would you behave? You know, I think our days well, would go a lot. Uh, they would go a lot differently, wouldn't they? Let's take that as the message for the day. Let's try and live today like it's our last day on earth, because it could be. And one, one thing that's uh, this reminds me of. You guys are talking about that, and the verse started off about um like being saved from your lips or something like that hmm. james says at least chapter three maybe chapter four it says don't you know that your life is but a vapor i hear one moment and gone the next 
And this comes immediately after a long section section of scripture where he's exhorting the unbeliever to uh, repent of uh, his bad speech. He says, like, the tongue sets the whole world on, you're like, it lights the whole world on fire and it's itself set on fire by hell. And it's like the tiniest little member, but it, like, causes all this damage. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a really in, um, pretty big theme in the Bible that yeah. words can like condemn you. If you look at Isaiah, he starts off his ministry by saying, "Oh, I'm a man of unclean lips," and the the angel has to come and like burn his tongue, all right, to purify it, so yeah. he can speak in the name of the Lord. Which you know, key not, part of this. The, mm-hmm. Go ahead, sorry. Just to finish, I was going to say, not in a prophetic sense, but that's what we're all basically trying to do here. We're trying to read the scripture and be able to say, thus saith the Lord. So we don't want, we want to, you know, be the proper vessel to do that in all the biblically prescribed ways. Right. Yeah. I think the most important part of this verse is, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle. And so, you know, the heart is wicked and the tongue causes all this harm so we have to restrain our tongues and then our hearts because if your heart isn't restrained your tongue will speak evil but i like this uh, actually psalm 38 is is like my favorite like repentance verse but i read it not so long ago and it's like really heavy right and you got to wonder like because this is written by solomon is written by the same guy as um, i mean psalms is written by the same guy as ecclesiastes right they're both solomon I think there's various Psalms authors of the, of the Psalms, though. Isn't there a few different... Um... Yeah, there's some others, but the majority of the Psalms are David. Right. Okay. Because when you read Psalm 38, and I apologize, it's only about half a page long, but I'd like to read it again as a prayer. Uh, but I also want to ask you guys about some, some, some parts of it after, so I'll read it quickly. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure, for thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head, as an heavy burden they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled, I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long, for my loins are filled with a loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. That verse, I think, is really interesting. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart, especially when you compare it to the exact next verse, Psalm 39. So here it says, I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Whereas in Psalms 39, it says, I am dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good. That's just the very next verse. So in one, he's roaring because of the disquiet of his heart. And the next, he's dumb with silence. But anyways, Lord, all my desire is before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it is also gone from me. My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore, and my kinsmen stand afar off. They also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they that seek my hurt speak mischievous things and imagine deceits all the day long. But I as a deaf man heard not, and I was as a dumb man that openeth not his mouth. Thus I was a man that heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope thou wilt hear, O Lord, my God. For I said, hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slippeth, they magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare mine iniquity, I will be sorry for my sin. But mine enemies are lively, and they are strong, and they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. They also that render evil for good are mine adversaries, because I follow the thing that good is. Forsake me not, O Lord, O my God, be not far from me, and make haste to help me, O Lord, of my salvation. So there's a few things that are interesting there. One I wanted to ask you guys, when he says, for my loins are filled with a loathsome disease, do you think he was being metaphorical, or do you think he actually got, like, an SCD and was, like, talking about it? Um, without, without really considering the whole, whole lot and reading, like, reading into it, I'm, I'm thinking it's more, like, from the depths of within himself. He's, like, you know, ridden, you know, with, with what he's calling disease, but is more more likely he's probably talking about 
the way he behaves, I think, and practices. Yeah, if you assumed that all the stuff that David talks about in terms of like his mortal physical uh ailments like that they were that they were actually physical like you're gonna have one like pretty wacky warrior king you know what i mean (laughs) (laughs) he's gonna be like (laughs) he's gonna be like blinded and like choking on dust and crawling around like wasted starving (laughs) like you know what i mean like flogged so right. like but wail, David, wailing constantly yeah right. david did yeah. have a harem of some thousands of women though right uh, uh probably so, maybe Sol- i don't solomon solomon did, did yeah solomon, solomon married had house and three, 300 right. concubines and 700 wives. and they didn't they didn't have condoms or anything like that back then so i mean i'm not trying to say he did actually have an std but i mean it seems possible yeah, and it's, I mean, it's they were just aware that one verse, right? right? He says, "My wounds stink and are corrupt. My loins are filled with a loathsome disease." And then it says, "My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore." So it's kind of like he's saying, "My lovers stand aloof from the sore that he has." Right after he mentions having a loathsome disease in his loins, so it's like, yeah, he did have a harem though, because like to get. To make peace in his kingdom, he took a wife from each of the constituent parts of his kingdom and then made a, yeah. Mm-hmm. You're talking about King David, though? I could be wrong. If it's yeah. not King David. Because then he's was... the same person that sent out that man to war as well to take his yeah. wife. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so. if, if he had multiple partners, multiple wives, they would all be his and only his, though, right? It's like, it wouldn't it be forbidden to even touch them? Or look at yeah, them? it would be. It would rely on them having, because I think they would have chosen only virgins, obviously, to be the in the king's harem, probably, most likely. But of yeah, course, so we all, we all know that have- there can be people who are not virgins, who you might not realize that they're not virgins. In other words, like people could have an STD, but I don't, I don't want to read too deep in the STD part of this verse. That's not really the important part. The important part, I think, here is, um, for I am ready to halt, right? He says, for I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. And this is after he's talking about um, his foolishness and his sins or whatever. And so he's saying, I'm ready to halt my sin. And then he says, for I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. So it's talking about, like, I will declare my iniquity, right? I will pronounce my sin and be sorry for it. So it seems to be talking about like the importance of acknowledging your sin and like speaking of it. In other words, you know, just, just from the way he wrote, I can only imagine that he was just as passionate and eccentric, you know, in in his practices in speech and probably in his behavior and presence. So I'm sure that like when he's writing like this, like he was probably the kind of guy that like, if you walked in the room and he felt like he wasn't in the right state with God, he'd probably start yelling about how wretched he was and for you to depart his presence. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, get out, don't be in here. I'm disgusting. You know, like, <laughs> I- I'm sure that was him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I mean, the, the other encouraging part is like, he's being obvious that he has all these serious sins that the Lord is rebuking him with. But then he says also, um, Make haste to help me, O Lord of my salvation. So it's like, uh, I mean, it's about God's forgiveness ultimately, right? Mm -hmm. The God of salvation. But here's a question more theologically. I know it's a little bit outside the bounds of a strict Bible study. But in what sense was God the God of salvation before Jesus, right? Because we're taught that Jesus was how we were saved by God. But the Jews didn't wait on Jesus. They said God was their salvation. So were they deceived or were they saved in a different way before the coming of Jesus? I mean, considering everything that the Jews did, God was continually delivering and uh, graceful and uh, um, merciful to these people constantly. So they should have felt very delivered in most in most situations of their life. Even the situations where they faced immense hardship, God, God got them out of those situations. So. I mean, in that sense, I would say, yeah, sure, definitely. But it was more about the Old Testament was very much more about his relationship with those he had a covenant with than it was 
generally the whole world, obviously. So, um, right. To, to be used as an example, right? So. Which is why we sort of run into a difference of opinion with Mr. Batman, because he emphasizes the importance of following all the commandments of Leviticus, whereas a lot of us are like, no, those were specific commandments for the Jews, not necessarily for Gentiles. But Mr. Yeah. Batman says there are no Gentiles. He says that we are all Jews because, or we're all Israelites because we're grafted onto the, the tree of Israel. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think you're, you're necessarily going to go wrong if you're practicing all those laws. I just don't think that it's necessary to practice all those laws. Right. Those, those, I, are, not, those are not the thing that are, that are salvific in and of themselves, but those are obedient things to do. And if you love God, I think it's good that you might do those things or some of those things, but not that they're necessary things. Yeah. And the problem with Leviticus is a lot of the laws have to do with killing certain people for sins that they've committed, like homosexuals or adulterers. And I feel like that's a very, very dangerous thing that if anyone were to do that, you know, because God says, like, judge not, lest ye be judged, as you measure onto others, so shall it be measured onto you, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think any of us are able to follow those commandments without actually breaking the commandments of Jesus in a way. Right. right. I mean, we could follow them if we set up a proper court correctly, but... Yeah, like it requires two, three independent witnesses, the proper like judge authority structure, and all this like stuff that just doesn't exist anymore because God has done away with it. The Bible, the Bible actually teaches that anyone who teaches these laws that people have to follow them again be be damned. Right. So you think no, and, Matt, and, well, that's yeah. I, and not, I mean, it's, and it's it says not it that the world about circumcision, and that's it. and he said it flat out in his speech yesterday that circumcision is necessary. Yeah, he an believes, eternal he believes in the Old Testament. All right, not the Old Testament. He believes that like Jesus didn't come to change that. So he believes that even though well, he's this message to the Gentiles, what's happening is actually they're being called to like observe the Jewish Torah. And so uh-huh. over time, I've seen Batman slowly drift from Christianity to wearing tis tis and all these things. So I think he's got a heavy kind of like, mm-hmm. yeah. That's why he like he won't say he won't say Galatians five two is real, you know. Even though Paul says those that are circumcised they have no profit to Christ, because if you're circumcised, you're still following the old Torah, right? That means you're in observance mm-hmm. and fear of that old God. And so what he says, he says, even though it says these things in the Bible, he says that the actual hidden message is, or the one that should be openly, you know, open for all to see, is the fact that it's telling you you should do these things. But I mean, yeah, that's I mean, not my even, opinion. That's, that's what I've like, you know, my observance it's, of it. Yeah, it's even worse than that because changed. what the Bible says is not, if you are circumcised, then Christ shall avail you nothing. It says, if you allow yourself to be circumcised, then Christ shall avail you nothing, right? And obviously babies, they don't get a choice in the matter. But what Mr. Batman seems to be suggesting is that adults should make the choice to become circumcised. Yeah. And that, as far I as I understand, that. literally is made explicit in the Bible. I've talked about it a lot when I used to debate circumcision. It's literally saying, it says you were cut off from God if you do that. It literally uses the word cut off from God. And it's like, that's some of the heaviest language in the Bible. So it could be really dangerous if people listen to Mr. Batman and we're like, we should be circumcised. But. It also yeah. says in Acts 15 in the Jerusalem Council, which which was good for the apostles and from God, the Holy Spirit, can, uh, that the Gentiles should not be circumcised. And then immediately after that council, they go down to Antioch. And Mr. Batman has this whole apologetic about how Antioch is where they were first called Christian. And that's because in Antioch, they stopped uh, following the Torah and split away from uh, the Pharisees, and and that was bad. That it was bad that they did that. But literally, all the all the Christians in Antioch did was listen to what the Holy Spirit said and do it. And then you got Mr. Batman in the 21st century because of other pre commitments going into that verse and saying, well, the the Pharisees were right to to call them Christians and to kick them out. You know, <laughs> it's pretty wild. Right, and we don't want to go sideways from our Bible study too much to talk about. Mr. Batman, but it came up relevantly. Yeah, it's uh, it's not so much about Mr. Batman that it's more about the this 
false Hebrew uh, roots teaching is really becoming more and more prevalent all over the place, so it should be fought against and understood. Well, that'll be right, yeah. Does anybody else uh, have a verse they want to read or maybe a prayer they want to say? I figure we could talk. We could probably talk about the other one that I was, I was going to bring up outside of a a Bible study because this is more like if I'm making a contentious point and trying to debate rather than necessarily trying to edify immediately, right? So this is interesting. Here uh, it says in Ecclesiastes ten chapter uh, four. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. This is actually an interesting verse, because if I understand it right, well, it's kind of weird, because it says, if the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee. So what ruler is it talking about? Because at first it makes it sound like if the king, if an enemy rises up against you, don't back down, because you'll just be, uh, what was the word they used when Hitler took that country? Um, appeasement right so first reading it seems to be saying like don't don't back down because yielding pacifieth great offenses but maybe i'm reading it completely backwards if the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee leave not thy place for yielding pacifieth great offenses so you don't have any idea what it means when it says the spirit of the ruler is it talking about god or is it talking about like the devil well, yeah, there I think it's pretty easy. I would need to do the context a little bit more, but there's this like dual understanding of like the spirit of particular Elohim being over rulers. That's how like the king of uh, whichever city can both properly be called by his name and Satan because they were, you know, they were a city set against Israel. And, um, that you see that all throughout the Old Testament. There's like a spirit that's like a prince of the city. Uh, like the prince. What, what am I thinking of? Bruning, you probably know. It's like the prince of Tyre. It's the prince of like. Oh, oh. Spirit well, of the Ty- East. Tyre got, Tyre got wrecked. Didn't they? Right. You're talking about when Daniel says, uh, the archangel says to him, like, I've been trying to get to you, but the prince of the spirit of Persia has been like wrestling yeah. against me. Yeah, that's another one, exactly. Yeah, so there's like, there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a spiritual reality where like the... The prince, the prince of the power of the air is the other one, I think. Right. So like in, in, the of the east. Which, which is like Satan, so... Yeah, so in Daniel, they have like the angels working for them and the other, like the humans have the angels like fighting the same fight that they're fighting. Which for, for Daniel, it's you know Persia versus Israel, and in the heavenlies, it's like the archangel versus the the spirit of the prince of Persia. And then later, you have the prince of Tyre being identified as Satan, mm-hmm. but in the same sentence, it's also referring to the ruler, like the physical ruler, like by name, whatever the prince's name of Tyre is. And then, yeah, you mentioned the third one from Ephesians as well, so. The Prince of Tyre, his name's sort of like an A. It was like A something, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is actually a verse that, during my last little episode, seemed super significant to me and mysterious. Uh, this is from the following chapter in Ecclesiastes, chapter 11. It says, chapter 11, verse 1, Ecclesiastes 11, 1, says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. So this is just like kind of stated there, and there's no real further uh, explanation of it as far as I can see. But if you take it on its like metaphorical, literal face, it's like, imagine you go down to the river with a loaf of bread, and you throw your loaf of bread in the river and it floats away. And then after many days, you're hungry and you like find a loaf of bread. Like, I don't know if that's what it's saying, but it seems to be saying something like that. Like, you know, what do you guys think that means? Cast thy bread upon the waters for thou shalt find it after many days. Not sure. I'd have to read. I don't know. More before and after. It sounds like bad advice. Like if you throw your bread on the water, you're not going to find it a couple of days later. It's just going to be gone. I think, I guess I think like, if I had to if I had to guess 
that's like um it's not fully fleshed out but what it's what i think it's saying is like if you're throwing bread in the water you're going to draw on fish because they think they're going to get fed there and then days later you can come back and go fishing and now you got a bunch of meat you know so i don't know i kind of see it as like you shall reap what you sow and like you're sowing your bread onto the water it's not necessarily literally the water but like i don't know it's like if you give you shall receive in the future maybe because the following verse says give a portion to seven and also to eight for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth which is also interesting because it uses the language give a portion to seven and also to eight so is it saying give a portion of your food to seven people and then to eight people or is it saying give your portion to seven people and then one more which is eight I don't know why it would necessarily even matter, but the language is weird when it says seven and also eight. Yeah, there's a poetic structure <laughs> then. Mm-hmm. I think I think it is like that. It's like um to like to seven and even to eight, like rather than seven and then eight, you know. So but it's... but much but much less about the number and more so about the action, like to be to be charitable. Yeah, it's used in the Proverbs, too. It'll say, like, there are five things that God hates and six things that are an abomination or three things I don't understand and four that are majestic. Yeah. and Like a holy spirit, a lying tongue, and all those things. Right. And what it's saying, it's not saying that, like, God only hates six of these and then the seventh one is an abomination that he doesn't hate. Mm -hmm. He's saying that, you know that he hates all of these things and they're even like abominations. That's how bad they are. Mm -hmm. And by the way, abomination, people always, you hear the word abomination, you think of some like monster with tentacles and like eyes all over it. Some like Lovecraftian monster, but abomination literally means something that God hates. So to say seven things that God hates, eight that are an abomination to him, it's a repetitive, like abomination and God hates means the same thing. It's like literally the definition of abomination is something that God hates. Well, anyways, gentlemen, I didn't want this one to be too long. So unless anyone has anything else they wanted to cover, I was going to close. One. I was going to close with uh, with um, one final set of verses. Uh, Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh for childhood and youth are vanity. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Amen. Amen. Does anyone want to close with a prayer? Amen. Sorry, Kashega. I just Make said sure amen. Sure yeah. All right. Well, I'll, I'll close with the prayer. I didn't still didn't hear what you said, but Heavenly Father God, in the name of your Son Jesus Christ, we give you thanks and praise for this opportunity to come together and study your Word. We hope that you will plant your Word like a seed in our hearts, and it will grow in understanding and guide us to live the kind of lives that you want us to lead, and help us to live today as though it is our last day, drawing close to you and your Word. For we know not the day or the hour of our own death, nor the great and terrible day of the Lord. Therefore, help us to remain in readiness, keeping our robes clean and losing not our crown that is set aside for us on the day of salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. Sunday morning Bible study. Out of the way, God bless. And uh, have a wonderful Sunday. Go to church if you can.